Hello, you're listening to Wine Blast and I'm Susie Barry. I thought it was important to to introduce myself properly because uh, <laughs> I actually forgot to do that in the last episode. You did, you did. I mean, it's apparently. easily done. It's easily done. And I think, I think most people know who you are. Well, maybe, so but, uh, you know, I'm willing with the stopwatch anyway. But uh, <laughs> either way, hello, it's me and I'm here as ever with my husband, fellow master of wine and lockdown sounding board, Peter Richards. Mm. On which note, we should clarify probably that the stopwatch was for a specific reason. It was. It uh, was. We were trying to make our shortest ever episode <laughs> last time, which, which we and managed, we needed a by stopwatch. the way. But I think, you know, if we're being really honest, we had to have a bit of a lie down afterwards. Oh, it's not us, is it? Sort of indigestible, wasn't it, really? Like, <laughs> wine doesn't do fast. Oh, we just can't. We can't. Well, we just waffle. Wine or food. <laughs> no, <laughs> let me rephrase. Well, I think we like going into the detail of things and, and the fun of things. And I think wine needs that. It needs to be able to breathe. So today... In this episode, we are going to allow ourselves to breathe. A bit more breathing space. Yes, we breathe. Literally. Uh, yes. And, and, and just briefly, since we're talking about um, interruption to our normal episode service, mm -hmm. uh, we also have a little admission, don't we? Because we were a little bit naughty last week, not putting out an episode. We were naughty. We were. Apologies. Sorry. Apologies. Yeah. We're normally so regular. We... <laughs> I think being regular in life is really important. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's different. Yeah. Keep anyway, moving. let's no, let's move on. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, apologies to to everybody expecting their regular blast. But we do have a relatively good excuse, and mm. it's uh, mm. it's not just that it was school holidays, which it was, of course. Uh, but you were busy hosting, weren't you? The yeah. ver your very first online film premiere. Thanks for the. Uh, thanks it's quite for glam. The, thanks for the tea up there. With nice. Mr. With the um, it was. Do you know what? It was Wine Masters TV. Yeah, no, it was really, really. The Torres fun. family. Um, online premieres, I think, are the way forward because you don't even have to leave your own home. I mean, I was just sitting here in my, in my shorts. You, know, you were. No red carpet, but red shorts. They were, they were <laughs> I red, if, weren't I they? If that was subliminal. <laughs> Um, and I shouldn't probably be admitting that either. I wouldn't admit you have red given, shorts. Given no. the wine trade issue with red trousers, red red, red trouser yeah. wear. Um, but no, you know, it was it was really fun and and. Comfort of your own home, bag of popcorn, you know, some lovely wine. And we got to watch a great film um, about rediscovering ancient great varieties in Penedes with the Torres family. Lovely Torres family. It's a great, yeah, um, they are amazing. And it was and a lovely it's, story it in a climate film, change. It really and, and, it, we, and then, you know, people got the chance. We had questions from all over the world and, and people asking questions of the, the stars of the show. Uh, which I was putting to them. So we had Mr. Torres, the famous, the legend who is Mr. He Torres. Is, he is a legend, uh, isn't then he? Then we had Miguel uh, and Maria, his two children who are now sort of heading up the firm. Uh, we had Tim Atkin, Christy Canterbury as sort of mm. commentators and Class de Jong, the Class de Jong, the, the filmmaker. So yeah. it was, I think it was, I think it was really fun. It and, was, and, and nice as you say, you can bring together people from all over the world in such an easy format. So, mm. Um, mm. so one of win, the win. online applications that, 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 that's going well. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to let you just focus on me. I'm going to shift the focus back to you because... You were also busy. You were doing some live recordings I as was, well, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, and I, was, and I am going to bring this in. I'm going to bring this in. You were also struggling. Oh. <laughs> no, no, shush, please. Let, allow me to finish the sentence. You were also engaged in a heroic struggle with some bread. Oh, you were You're yeah, right. You were right. You said you wouldn't no, mention that, but anyway. This is the time and place. Um, we yes. need to, okay, we need to okay. work through. Okay, okay, I'm going to quickly confess that yeah. I was a, I was a bit late to the party, but like, <laughs> um, I don't know, the, the world and his wife in lockdown, I just couldn't resist the temptation to make a loaf of sourdough bread. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! It, but it was such a monumental faff. It really was. Um, mm. uh, it was messy, mm. uh, mm. time-consuming. Um, mm. I mean, it took ten days just to make the blooming starter. Uh, and starter. Then, I, know, I never knew the word starter could be used in no. that context before. No, and, and then it kept popping up every cupboard. <laughs> it's I normally opened, a prawn every cocktail, isn't it? Drawer I opened in the house. Yeah. There was the stinky starter. Stinky starter, and the kids even moaned it was in their in their games cupboard. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Was we. It? we, we <laughs> Oh it was. I was trying to find the, the right, right temperature. Okay, but, and I'm going to say there is a but, because it's an important but. When we actually got around eventually to tasting that bread, it was the best bread we'd ever tasted, wasn't it? Yes. Almost slightly, unfortunately, it really was. Yeah. I mean, goodness me, that it was delicious. And not just because I'd made it, maybe a little bit that, but really really the most fantastic bread you do like um, the challenge though that's part i of, love part the challenge of you. You just, i really can't love let i can't you. let something go like that no no and it, and it wasn't going to beat me mm. but, but i almost almost wanted it to i almost wanted it <laughs> not to work so that i could ditch the starter throw it away and never ever go near sourdough again but unfortunately um thanks to the boy who bakes uh mm -hmm. Boy who bakes .co uk. that was it. it was his recipe ed kimber um and it was fantastic yeah mm, yeah okay. so i might i might sorry might just have another go we definitely didn't discuss that 
Sorry, I thought I'd do it on air so that, so that you, uh, you, you've you got no comeback from that. Um, I thought we'd agree not to, anyway, not to anyway, go there. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can just see the future here now. It's flashing for my eyes. The kids, <laughs> me and the kids are vagrants in our own house. You've completely forgotten about us. You're, you're sort of a slave all about to the sourdough. sourdough. Um, I'm, I'm in torn because it's so delicious, you know, that having it as fried bread with bacon and ketchup was... Oh, you did, yes, actually, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, forget the, the purest version. No, OK, but but the bottom line is it won't be any good for our podcast. No, schedule. indeed, it did, it won't. And, and thank you for bringing us <laughs> back on track okay. so seamlessly um, because, uh, well, you, you know, but before we finish on the sourdough, I think we, we may well keep you posted about uh, the sourdough drama as yes, it yeah. unfolds. And you know, who, who knows? Who knows? There may even be an episode in Matching Wines to Sourdough. They you know, could. They sourdough could. with freshly buttered bread yeah, yeah. or indeed the sourdough as the bacon sandwich. I know, just just to finish, because we are... I know. You know we I did know. actually try it with some wine, didn't we? We had some wine We open. did, we um, did. I mean, because partly because somebody suggested on social media, why didn't we do a whole episode on bread yeah, and yeah. wine matching? So so who knows? You know, we, we, we could do that. I always remember asking James Martin at a, at a BBC Gafu show, what was your fav- what's your favourite comfort food? And his was um, freshly baked bread with, with some butter. And I have butter. to say... It would butter. be butter. butter. It was It's not bread. Um, butter. And, and I thought, yeah, Yes, you know, maybe slip slip yeah. some fish fingers on top of it, but you know, no, we... oh, you cannot go there. Anyway, no, no. we're talking about wine, yeah. wine and food, but actually, yeah, very yeah, purist. Yeah, yeah. But you know, you liked it with you like that freshly but- buttered sourdough with some uh, new wave New Zealand Sauvignon. Didn't yeah, you? it was it was sort of new wave style, but um, I really did. Yeah. Um, what was surprising was that the the, the Chardonnay that we tried, mm. the slightly rich buttery Chardonnay that we thought would be great with it. Just didn't quite quite work. It didn't work. So anyway. there is there's an investigation to be done because there I is. love the Ribolla Gialla. From Slovenia with the sourdough. I mean, you th- love that wine with that, everything. That is peak lockdown. Yeah, let's that, move on. Is... Let's move on. Come on. <laughs> We're not getting into Ribola Giala again. What we okay, are fine. getting into yes, in this show Come on. is Riesling, Yay, the Riesling grape Riesling. variety. Ooh. Now, um, we, we did touch on this in our, as we know, in our best white wine grape episode mm. when Riesling was slightly controversial. It was voted by a narrow margin over Chardonnay as the best white wine. Great variety. But it wasn't straightforward. It was a very narrow margin of victory, wasn't it? And it was. it was a bit contentious, wasn't it? It was. Which was the interesting um, part. It was in, that was the best yeah. best bit in many ways. Why is because, um, controversial? Well, well, as Nick said, Nick in the trade, uh, he pointed out that some people, uh, and I think this is in the wine trade, feel mm. they need or ought to like Riesling, to choose Riesling as their top variety mm. because it is considered the wine lover's grape par excellence, you mm. know. Mm. But yeah. but what his point was that actually a lot of, you know, regular wine drinkers just don't really get it. They don't necessarily like it that much. Yeah, yeah. I suppose Chardonnay is controversial as well, but for different reasons. But this is interesting. Yes. Riesling, you feel like you should say it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, what we thought we'd do there, therefore, is to come at Riesling from a different perspective, you know. Um, and later on in the show, we'll be sort of coming at Riesling from through the prism of food, if you like, which I think is, is always a great democratising. It's, it's it's it makes very, it more yeah. accessible. Well, it? you know, we know. You, you drink wine, you're going to be you make almost s- always with food. <laughs> So many of us make sense of wine through food. Yeah. And that's a really powerful tool. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to be cooking up uh, the most delicious monkfish and prawn curry. Uh, we've also got some port terrine, haven't we? Because we, we wanted to mix it yeah. up a little bit. Uh, with recent from all around the world, inc- including, you know, we've got some dry and sweet German ones, New Zealand, Australia, all, all around the world. Just, just to try and make some sense of it through food. Um, yeah. and, and we're also, we've got a few user-friendly tips about Riesling as well. We have indeed. But before mm. that, uh, we oh, are very excited because mm. we are talking with Mr. Riesling. We've got to call him that, Mr. haven't we? Mr. Riesling. World famous German producer Ernst Lösen. I feel Lösen. I have to say it like that. Lösen. Lösen. Is this a wrong, yeah. wrong pronunciation? I don't know. Well, you Lozen, know. Lozen, Lozen, Lozen. Potato, Lozen. potato. <laughs> anyway, we all know who we're talking about. He is, uh, he is Mr. Riesling. Mm. Uh, he's, uh, he's talking to us from his base in the Mosul, uh, where he has been essentially, I mean, evangelising about Riesling all over the world for decades. Mm. Um, he, uh, Germany, obviously going on to the coronavirus um, issue, has been uh, one of the countries noted for dealing probably most effectively with it. They've had, mm, they've, mm. I think they've had low mortality rates, haven't yeah, they? Well. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's all attributed to, um, I mean, you, you know, you can imagine, Jeremy, that they're, they're well-provisioned health system, competent local national governance. Not making any comparisons um, anyway. Well, <laughs> well, it's not funny. You know. but, but they've done really, really well. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, Ernie, as he's known uh, to his friends and to everyone, really uh, he was holed up in Burncastle due to the lockdown which apparently his dog is very happy about <laughs> but the master 
is a little bit frustrated by. Yes, yeah. I, mean, I don't think conference calls and online cook-alongs are quite good enough for, 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 for Ernie. Well, they're just not enough, I think. You know, he's got so much energy, you know, and a sort of prodigious careering mind, hasn't he? So I do warn you, this is quite a long chat. Um, and he spoke to me from Burke at Bancastle. And he was in his grandfather's library, where apparently the old man used to have his glass of Riesling cabinet at 4pm every day. I love you know. that. I love it. I love it. In fact, it's 4pm. It sounds a bit like my mum and her glass of wine. It's weird. Well, to be honest, I think for most people, it's the equivalent of a cup of tea in the afternoon. Yeah, anyway, yeah. it's much more civilised. Um, anyway, we, so I did, we had a chat and, and tasted the same bottle of wine together. Uh, his, his Dr. Lowe's and Dry Riesling, which, um, you know, actually followed on very nicely from his choice of quarantine wine. It which did we'll indeed. About. But I started by asking his reaction to our little poll about the best white wine grape. Um, and here's what he had to say. Well, I mean... I mean, this poll astonished me a little bit because we know we are fighting this this fight since 30 years, you know, especially when I started in England in the late 80s, you know, running with my Riesling flag to the countryside, you know, because the problem in these days was Riesling was cheap, you know, plonk, you know, and so it was very difficult. So, I mean, it, it's great after 30 years working hard on this, but I think also in the last 30 years, a lot of things change, you know. We, I mean, Germany definitely, I mean, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I mean, uh, we are responsible for that, this disaster about all these kind of cheap long, which was, I mean, people thought that's reasoning. So we have been going back to our old traditions, you know? I mean, there was, I mean, we all know in a hundred years ago, reasoning was the most famous and most expensive grape variety, even in England. And so why, why did it, I mean, why it sucked now, you know? So because we had been losing all our traditions, we had been going away from our concrete vineyard sites, we had been going away from the grape variety, we put stuff into a bottle which looked like reasoning, but there was not a drop of reasoning in there. And all these kind of things, you know, disaster. We all know the disaster. And that took 30 years ago to, 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 to show the people that Riesling belongs to the great white grape varieties as it is Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc or whatever, you know. And so it's good that the people get aware about it again. But this is the only way how to get back, how you get back the reputation really exciting it's to see very very exciting and, very and really exciting. positive isn't it and and equally you know riesling not just in germany um, yeah. but all around the world and, and you're oh, obviously yeah. involved in a few projects of these around the world uh, with I with riesling and other great varieties when i was the first time in australia that is possibly also 20 years ago you know i was man when we still have been struggling with riesling in australia every winemaker had his riesling and was so proud of his riesling and doing you know, I mean, cross it, you know, who possibly was the first generation showing great reasoning in Australia. And now reasoning in Australia is amazing. And, you know, we do a project together, reasoning together with uh, Jim Barry, Peter Barry and his two sons. And we just launched it. That was just before Corona. It was uh, middle of uh, February. I was in Australia. We launched this project. I wanted to make a dry reasoning, but in the style of my great grandfather, you know, exactly. We, we sent barrels over from Germany and we did it exactly as we do our GG reserve. You know, I said, wow. Can we do this? I would love to do an Australian reasoning, but in the way as we think doing a dry reasoning. And then these kids said, Well, but then we want to make a reasoning in Mimosa with you in the Aussie style. If you want to do a German style dry Riesling as your grand grandfather did in here, then we do an Aussie style Riesling here in the Mosul. Great, great project. We launched it two years in the barrel. I mean, on the full yeast as I do my GG reserve and GGs, you know, and we just launched it. And I think it's now the most expensive Australian Riesling, you know, it's a hundred uh, Australian dollar retail, you know. Now, you also make wine in, in the Falz uh, yes. and in Washington State uh, and yes. in Oregon. Um, yes. You are a record of saying a great wine begins in your head. Now, most yes. people say a truism in wine is a great wine begins in the vineyard. So can you just explain what you mean by that? Yes. Let, I have a very clear idea about this saying because a great wine I mean, starts in your head, what I mean, and that comes by an very long time ago, possibly oh, 30, more than 30 years, middle of the 80s. I've been sitting together 
with my Swedish importer, you know? And he was very spontaneous. He phoned me, oh, I'm here. Can we meet? I said, yeah, let's go in the evening for, uh, for dinner. I would bring a great bottle of wine, you know? And so it was, um, and then he said, yeah, but I worked also with a small crower together here in the Mosul. Can he join too? And I said, yeah, sure, why not, you know? So I brought a bottle of, um, I don't remember even anymore. It was a um, 85 or uh, what was it? Uh, a Chateau Latour, you know? I opened the bottle, beautiful, matured, everything was perfect bottle, you know? Um, possibly a little bit too young. And then I poured it and then this young man said, whoa, this, this, this wine smells, and the, the, as the old Bordeaux did, oh, that is leather and horse, horse smell and you know, and all oh, the tannin, oh, oh, this wine is horrible. This wine is horrible, he said, you know? And then he opened a bottle of red wine he produced on the Mosul, you know? And this was totally light, nearly rosé in color, you know? It was sweet, you know? A horrible wine for me, you know? And then I thought, and this guy never had anything else as his own red wines, as my father did and as he did, sweet, very, t I mean, a pale color. And so, I thought that is the greatest thing. You know what it is? That, I mean, a great wine starts first in your head. If you never drank great wines in your life, you will never know what a great wine is. And if you, if you don't know what a great, you can have the best vineyards, you know? But if you don't know what a great wine is, how you want to produce a great wine? And that's the reason you, I always say, you have to drink loads in your life that you, at the end of, the, of your life, you know, and then you can distinguish good wine and great wines from lesser good wines. And that was this example with this young gentleman. I said, I can't claim him, you know, that he, he was right in describing the wine, you know. But for him, that was all horrible things because he didn't, was not experienced, you know, drinking great wines in his life. Love your philosophy, and he drinks mm. shed loads. That's, it's always yeah, a good yes. way to go. <laughs> yes. uh, and it's educational. That's the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah. Finally, what is your ideal quarantine wine? And exceptionally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you, I don't allow anyone this, I'm going to allow you two. Uh, they can't mm. be anything to do with your wines. You, none of your wines yeah. are wines you have an interest yeah. in. Yeah. But mm. one, of, one of yours can be Riesling, and one of yours has to be something else. It's so difficult, you know, to choose. If you, if you have, a, my, you know, my private cellar is more than 10,000 bottles, you know. If I have to name something, I would say you would go for the, the most memorable wines again, because you want to taste the mem most memorable wines again. And possibly my most memorable wine, if it comes to red, was also a very long time ago. A friend of mine brought a 1969 Chambatin from Amont Rousseau. And this wine I have still in my head as it was yesterday, you know? And then my uncle, my old uncle, sadly he died last year, he opened a few times, uh, 1949, you know, Riesling Feinster Ausleser, Wilhelmer Sonnenuhr. Oh my God, that is also something, you know? Well, after that I could die, you know? <laughs> okay, so and I've got a lovely bottle of wine in front of me, for yes. which thank you, uh, the Dr. Mm -hmm. Lozen, uh, 2017. Now, I'm going to let you pronounce the intricacies of the name, uh, yeah. so I'll get it wrong. But one really important thing about this bottle, it's a very special bottle, it's, it's, it's not cheap, £36, I think. But it says mm -hmm. it's got a big label on, uh, on the front saying dry. Talk to me about why that's important. To, to just to, to give you a little bit of an overview, the Dr. Lozen estate is an amalgamation of two estates. My father and my mother were both single kids. And my mom comes from the Prim family, their tradition the last hundred years was only to produce the traditional fruity style cabinet spade with a house laser with a little bit of residual sweetness to balance the acidity. But my father's family from Erzig, my great grandfather, my grandfather, produced only dry wines in the last hundred years, you know. And my father gave it up when 53, when he married, you know. And after the war, the fruitier style was more fashion, fashionable dry wines have been going totally out of fashion, but that doesn't necessarily mean, and a lot of people always think, German Rieslings have been always sweet, you know? That it was our tradition. Here in the Mosul, we had both traditions, you know? And in the South, they had been always dry. Um, but after the war, people weren't sweet, you know? you know? I mean, they had suffering so long, you know? And the sweet was more in. But my grandfather made only dry wines, and it was 2008, 
a very, very old customer visited me of my grandfather and grandfather. They still knew them, very old guy. And he said, I'm not sure if you are aware that your grandfather and great grandfather from Erzig, the Erziger Oper, made only dry wines. And they said, yes, I've heard about it, but we said we don't have them anymore. And he said, I brought you a present. I brought you a 1947 Erziger Wurzgarten Riesling Dry, GG, Grosses Gewex, which means Grand Cru. So you can taste it, you know? And so weeks later, I opened it, and it was a 51-year-old wine, a 51-year-old dry Riesling. I had a lot of fruity style Rieslings that old, you know? Like the 49, which I have been talking about, um, Feine Auslitter, absolutely gorgeous. The Riesling sweetness helps to let these wines age. But this dry wine was also beautiful, perfectly matured, it's not a fresh wine, perfectly matured, beautifully, beautiful dry wine. Then I thought, man, what did this old gentleman did making dry wines which can age like that? You know? It's amazing. And I thought, okay, I've been going to my winemaker and said, we have to make dry wines now like my grandfather. And I changed the complete winemaking for our dry wines towards this old style. So that means he was a little bit worried and said, hey, we don't have any experience with that. Are you crazy? You know, I said, at least we will go back to indigenous years, back to other, our old barrels, which we still have, and at least one year in the barrel. And we do two years, we do three years in the barrel, and we are back to eight years in the barrel on the full yeast. Nobody is doing that. I was the first time we had been going back to this very old, say, kind of historic winemaking of dry wines of Germany. I tell you, I don't regret it at all. The result is amazing, you know? And this year, for example, what we have in the class, the 17 Wellener Sonnenuhr. Mm. Wellen is the village. Sonnenuhr means the sundial vineyard, you know? Because there's a big sundial built by J. 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 Jodokus Prüm, one of our great, 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 great uncles, you know? Uh, he built this beautiful sundial into the vineyard. So pretty soon the surrounding vineyards get the name sundial a Riesling, sure, 100% Riesling. And it says also Alte Reben, which means VA Vineyard, old vines. Because our area is the only area in Germany and possibly nearly all over Europe, which was never attacked by Phylloxera. And this is one of our oldest vineyard in Wehlen. These are more than 130 year old uncrafted vines, original rootstock, Front de Pied, you know? And we can hang it very long without getting over ripeness. And that is, the big, that is the big thing. We get enormous good aroma ripeness, but we never get, I mean, we never hit more with healthy grapes, never go more than 12, 12.5 alcohol, which I think is for reasoning perfect, for dry reasoning, perfect, you know? And so, so, and then so we've, we, both, we've both got a, a glass of this lovely Venom yes. 2017 dry, uh, yes. which you're explaining, beautiful, and it smells, Gorgeous. It's, it's, there's lots yes. of fruit, but there's also sort of floral, yes. slightly honey edge yes. to it. It's really complex. Yes. And on the palate, you get yeah. that lovely mm. spine-tingling acidity, yeah. don't you? And but you've also got a little bit of richness and succulence, don't exactly. you? Exactly. And, and for the dry wine, it's so harmonious, round, you know? These guys, 100, 150 years ago, they knew a lot of things, you know, which we don't know anymore. Because the problem is, since technology came into winemaking, you know, and that the first filters had been invented in the middle of the 20s and, and, and beginning of the 30s. In the very old days, the people had a lot of time, but no technology. They knew so much more what time does do to winemaking, you know? And then the technology was invented and they didn't have to wait anymore, you know? In the old days, they had to wait until the wine was clear, you know, because they had no filters. So they so had to keep it two or three years in the barrel. To get it so you talk right. about the, benef the benefits of time. Um, this yes. wine to me tastes like it's very young. With, with these yes. dry styles that you're doing, mm -hmm. do you mm -hmm. think they, they benefit, they need more yes. time to, to, to come into yes. their own than say the fruitier, I mean, slightly sweeter? The funny wine. thing is, the funny thing, you would think that a wine, you mature and on full yeast in the barrel, it ages faster, it oxidizes faster. The funny thing, it is just the opposite. As long as we keep the wines in the barrel and even on the full yeast, the wines get more elegant and get, I mean, the one which is, was eight years in the barrel on the full yeast, no? This is more elegant as this wine. Can you believe that? It is, and I, I mean, we forgot these things. We don't know these things anymore, you know? But this is a winemaking process where the people knew 
And in the old days, they drank it only old, you know? That is a winemaking process which, which enhance the aging potential of the wine that you can keep it much longer. And we have 10, 11 year old wines which have been two years in the barrel, you know, on the full yeast. They are fresh as a daisy. And that is for me very important. For me, a great wine needs also aging potential. For me, a great wine which is dead after two, three years is not a great wine for me, you know? Then, I mean, why should I pay a lot of money? And sorry, we have this kind of, you know, other discussion with the pre mox in Burgundy, white Burgundies, no? I mean, sorry, I'm paying $2,000 for Montrachet, and after 10 years it's oxidized. Sorry, I mean, there's a, there's a problem. They should think about it, you know? I yeah. want to produce wine which can age, you know, wait, can age wonderfully, which, which mature, you know, and get maturation and not oxidation. That's a huge difference, you know? <laughs> Ernie Lewison, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. That was really fascinating, wasn't it? The, the, about the history of drier German Riesling. Mm, because, yeah. I mean, I think most people would associate traditional German whites with being sweet, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, But actually, these days, I think some of the most exciting wines coming out of Germany, arguably, are the drier styles. And, and not just talking about things like Riesling, but also, you know, let's not forget Pinot Noir, you know, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris. Absolutely. And, and maybe that's got something to do with the climate warming up. I don't know. Who but, knows? Um, Who knows? But it's, you know, German doesn't always equal sweetness. That's no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we promised everyone we would be talking about food mm. in this episode. We did. We did. So, so let's talk food. food. <laughs> We've got some food in front of us. Let's, let's talk about it. Curry. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves a good curry, don't we? I mean, it's just wow, do, it's such an amazing do. food. If you like complexity, which most yeah. wine lovers do, yeah. it's a mouthful. Great curry. And we've got a beautiful curry here. But the question yeah. always is, yeah, yeah. what to drink with them? This is true. And uh, people do ask me that a lot. And I think the obvious answer is Riesling. We're going to say that, aren't we? But it's, it's what style. And with a curry, often a little bit of sugar just helps, doesn't it? Just to balance the spice. Actually, funny enough, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc can work because often with those styles that have a little bit of residual sugar, yeah. they just calm just the touch. heat on the tongue. You can't ever no. match everything. You just need to sort of calm things down. So, so we should, should say this this curry is um, mm. it is delicious. Mm. It's a monkfish curry that, that involves tamarind, so fruity tamarind mm. and coconut. So you've mm. got that lovely creaminess. Um, it, it's it's just, uh, but it's quite mild. Um, and I think what, what, we, what we found is that New World Rieslings, mm. but not the dry ones. So the Australian and New Zealand ones that have just got a little bit of sweetness or a German Cabernet. So a Mosel, maybe German Cabernet that's, again, young with a bit of sweetness is delicious. Yeah, They're so delicious if, if with this style, that style of dish. Up, it's brightness. There's a brightness of fruit, clarity of fruit in the yeah. wines. Um, probably lower alcohol and just yeah. slightly higher sugar. Yeah. Um, so just... that they just offset that heat and just, it's just a nice, smooth, refreshing match. But but what about the drier style, styles, which is what, yeah. you know, so, what so we've been So this was the interesting about. thing and this is what we were really wondering. Well, what about the dry? What, what do they go with food? So, yeah. so hence the port to read a little bit because the drier styles don't work so well with curry, do they? We were really surprised how hard it was to match dry styles weren't we to, mm, to food generally. we thought it mm. would be much 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 easier and we tried quite a few things but what we came down on was the the realization that the dry styles work better when they're a bit aged so one yes. of our favorite matches yeah. we, we got some pork terrine because that seemed you know with a bit of toasted sourdough of course it, that seemed a likely match for a dry german riesling but the one we liked the best was Schlo schloss Schoenburn, I, I can't say can't that. Can't really say that. Um, after, after I can't. How many glasses I... have you had? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a Schloss Schoenburn Riesling, and it's 2011. Now mm. it could be, you know, another wine. This was a particularly nice one, but you can see with nine years of age, it's a bit complex, a bit more complex, a bit rounder, and with that lovely fatty pork, with a meatiness, mm. bit of um, the savoury sort of herbal notes in the in the terrine. Mm. Just yeah. lovely. And that's the Pfaffenberg, appropriately enough for Saturday. Pfaffenberg. Pfaffenberg. Grosse <laughs> uh, GG, so dry. But that was delicious, I completely it agree. Was, but actually, was. you know, the one we tried, with, one I tried with Ernie, the, the Dr. Lozen Velen and Solonur 2017 dry, yeah. is again a lovely wine, but it's just, it needs time. And needs that's what Ernie was saying, wasn't it? These yeah. wines actually really need some time. Need a bit but, more you know, it. they're fine wines. They're yeah. not cheap. This is the other thing to say about yeah. dry gem recently. They're not cheap. And actually, the drier they are, the higher the alcohol tends to be, yeah. which is an interesting corollary, because obviously if you're familiar 
fermenting that well, sugar, let, the alcohol tends we, to be higher. I've, doesn't work so well with spice, but needs the right food. What about our top? Let's do our three. Oh, finish idea. with our three top yeah, tips. Three top, for, three top for, for Riesling. Tips. Okay. Go on. What, uh, me first, or you yeah, first? Yeah, you go. You okay, go. all right, fine. Uh, well, uh, alcohol level and, and and residual sugar. So, if you're wondering when you're buying a Riesling whether it's going to be sweet or dry, which I think is the main confusion for people, it doesn't always say on the label. If it says Trocken, you know it's dry on a German yeah, one, but it doesn't. Or it just the doesn't Dr. always Lose say. One does. Um, generally speaking, try to look at a good tip. Look at the alcohol level. If the alcohol level is sort of 10% or under, it's likely to have a fair amount of sugar in it. If the alcohol level is higher, it's likely to be drier. So 12, 13% is likely to be fully dry. Essentially because the sugar hasn't, well, in the dry one has been fermented out exactly. into alcohol. So my little tip um, is very simple. Just the sweeter styles of Riesling can make a great match for spicy food, mm -hmm. which we've said. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or a nice aperitif. For the, the or an aperitif. But, yeah, they're and, lovely in and, the summer. You know, as we've said, the drier styles benefit for some age. I think. That's it. That's yeah. our three top tips. Those are our three recent tips. There we go. So I think that's it. That's it. We're going to end here. We're going to. That's it for Riesling. Well, it's not, it's not really, is it? I mean, no, <laughs> probably it's just, not. Just scratching the surface. There's probably no end to the recent chat, but that's for another time. Another podcast, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, all the details and the wines and the monkfish mm. curry recipe, which is honestly something you have to try, are on our site as ever. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please do take a moment to rate and review the show on your listening platform of choice. Thanks to Ernie and, of course, to you for listening. Until next time, cheers.